how to turn a dull topic into something truly engaging. That's just one of the things we'll be talking about in this episode of Talking Talks. Hello and welcome to Talking Talks. I'm your host, Bree Williams, and today I am joined by Christian Hunt. Christian is the founder of Human Risk, a thriving UK-based consultancy that specialises in applying behavioural science to ethics and compliance. Christian also hosts the Human Risk podcast. Prior to founding Human Risk, Christian was the head of the behavioural science team within UBS, a global financial services firm, and was the chief operating officer of the UK Prudential Regulation Authority. Let's get started. Now, Christian, finance, regulation, compliance on paper, they are not the sexiest topics. So how do you go about taking what could be seen as a traditionally dull topic like compliance and engaging an audience with that topic? So so I think the most important thing is is to recognise that, right? If you make a presumption that it is going to be the most amazing and, and the subject will do the talking on its own, I think you're in real danger of being a bit like those school teachers that we all know who had really interesting subjects and managed to ruin it. So I think I sit there and say, I have to think very carefully about this. What will my audience be looking? Are they going to be genuinely interested in this? Or is the title of the thing, the subject, is, is that, does that have the potential to switch them off? And so if I'm talking to an audience that I know is going to be engaged in it, that's one thing. But I start from the premise that it's my job to make it interesting. So the first bit you can do is actually riff off that boredom. So I will make a joke about that. So the word compliance, I always say, is the worst bit of branding in history. Right? If you were trying to create a function that sounded dull and authoritarian, that's what you would come up with. And that doesn't really help people do the job. So I often start, if I'm doing a presentation on compliance, I will start, particularly to a compliance audience, I might do something counterintuitive, like saying, you know, I hate the word compliance. Now, there are a couple of different ways that you tend to introduce yourself. And one of them is the provocation and one of them's not. So let's just watch this. And I'd love to get your comments on this as your engagement strategies. So let's have a, have a look. And I thought I would start by explaining to you why it's my core passion. And also the comments I'm about to make about compliance aren't necessarily particularly positive. I don't mean the people in it. I just mean the way that it's delivered. And so I wanted to give you a sense of my background because I am coming from a perspective of being both a former regulator and a former head of compliance. So I began. I'm the founder of Human Risk, a company that specializes in bringing behavioral science to ethics and compliance. And I'm going to start with a very strange confession which is, I hate compliance. So I think those were giving us a taste. So in the second version of that, that was when you really became confessional around this comment around compliance. Yeah, so so in, in, in that case, I'm talking to an audience that is largely a compliance audience. So when I, when I, and, I, and very often, you know, I, I talk to a broad range of, di- of different people. So I, I work out a little bit before who is going to be in the room. And so if I'm taking a brand like compliance, the, the underlying joke stroke thought, if you like, is that the word compliance is awful and you wouldn't start, you know, we wouldn't start with that particular piece. And that, I think, plays into the dynamics of how people behave and how they perceive it. So what I want to do there is, is use that as a hook to say to people, actually, this, you know, I, I hate this thing. In other words, the thing that you've got me to talk about is something I don't like. Right, which sounds weird and counterintuitive. Now, it may be that if I'm talking to a compliance audience, I need to go into my background a little bit because I need to validate that I'm not an outsider criticizing their world. I know what they're going through and I'm one of them. If I'm talking to an audience that is more of a recipient of the compliance quote unquote services, then what I'm doing is kind of talking to them as a customer. So I don't need to talk so much about my background, but I'm attacking the premise of the presentation. So in both cases, what I'm doing is looking at it and saying, here's a really dull subject matter that I'm about to talk to you about. Let me, let me unpick that and, and recognize the, it was almost the elephant in the room. Let's recognize that truth that nobody likes this particular brand. And so how I set that up is very much dependent on the audience. If it's an audience that is compliance themselves, in other words, there's a risk of me criticizing them, then I have to establish credibility around who I am and that I'm one of them. If not, I can go straight into that line because the audience will recognize it. 
So the presentation we saw where it was more text heavy and you were talking about your background, you were playing to um, peers, so people that were, were used to uh, the, the work that you used to do. And so that was about establishing your credibility so that you could then throw, shot, throw shots at them. <laughs> Yeah, and it's also presenting it's also presenting a resume in a traditional way. So if I'm talking to a tr an audience that is used to going to traditional presentations, if I suddenly go off into some flight of fancy, that often they, they often think I'm a slightly strange person to be brought in. And I probably am at the more eclectic end of the presentation mix. But I will use quote unquote slides. Now, I am not a fan of slides at all because I think, you know, if it's just a case of reading the words on a page, People can do that for themselves. So I prefer to use imagery, icons, that kind of thing. What I've done with that particular slide is I've used a Lego image of myself. So it's slightly disruptive, right? But it's not uncomfortable. It's a little bit weird. You wouldn't tend to do that. So it's designed to just send a signal that we're moving in a slightly other direction, but I've presented my career in a traditional manner. As those presentations go on, I get a little bit more data. So what I'm trying to do is take my audience with me and, and what I often see is great presenters coming into, into serious contexts and kind of trying to destabilize the audience immediately. Now, that can be really effective. What I try to do is take them along. So by the end of it, we're in quite disruptive territory, but we've started off quite gently. Um, it certainly works for human beings is don't hit people with something that's going to alienate them. So the more technical the audience, the more I've got to sort of focus around the core, the less, the more provocative I can be. That is a really interesting insight because I must admit when I was watching both, my preference was for the um, the, the second one we saw, which was more storytelling. And so you, you didn't have the slides and um, you were free of those and you went straight into the, um, the, the narrative. And I'm going to start with a very strange confession, which is I hate compliance. Which I really found hooked me more as someone who doesn't work in compliance. So really interesting that you've you've walked me through that. I appreciate it. So certainly it sounds like um, a view to the audience. You really need to work out at what uh, where to pitch it and what sort of audience you're dealing with. Because I imagine, particularly when you're dealing with those who think they know a lot about compliance, you'll get the the folded arms close off if you don't take it gently, as you were mentioning. Yeah, and particularly because what, what I'm looking to do in my business is disrupt traditional ways of thinking. And so the content is already in itself disruptive. So I'm basically at its worst. I'm coming in and saying you're getting this slightly wrong. Now, I never present it in those terms. But of course, if I'm not mindful of the fact the, the people are going to be sitting there cynically, and, and you're right. And, and the interesting thing about a virtual, is, of course, those were both virtual presentations, is that you're not getting that immediate audience feedback. So if I, if I were in a physical room, I could see, uh, assuming it's not too dark, but I can see whether people got their arms crossed, I can see if they're disengaging, I can see if they're on their phones. In this virtual environment, I don't have that feedback. So I have to play slightly more cautiously with that and keep them with me at all times. Because, of course, the ability to lose people in a virtual presentation where they're, you know, either their cameras aren't on, or even if they are, if you're one of these calls where there's hundreds of people on there, there's very low risk from their perspective. And so it's much easier for them to disengage. So I'm much more focused around how can I keep them on that particular journey. And so these sorts of things, I think, become much more critical in a virtual environment than a physical one. That's interesting. And, and was it also a, um, a function of how long you had in the presentation? So the, the first introduction we saw was around a half hour presentation, I think, and the, and the second was a much shorter, sharper, say 15, 16 minutes. So was that also a consideration? Yeah. So, so uh, there are lots and lots of um, factors that go, go into thinking. So, so one will be how long have I got to, to make a point? The second thing is, what is my objective in doing this? Do I just want to spark interest in a topic? In other words, if I'm opening a conference or opening a session and I'm just there to literally drag people to a different place, to work, then that would be a different approach to I'm sitting in the middle of something and we're on a journey and I'm part of a broader piece. So I have to factor in, you know, what, what's, the, what's the wallpaper around my presentation? What, what have they just come out of? Am I, am I the straight after lunch slot? Different game to the straight before lunch slot or the, you know, the, 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 the just before drink slot is always interesting. So there's different dynamics at play during depending on the time. And of course, with global presentations, right, somebody's lunchtime is someone else's, you know, <laughs> afternoon, evening. So you've got to think about all of these particular things. Then there's the technological side of it. 
So I, there's a great piece of software, which I know you, you want to come to, which I love using, software called mm -hmm, which um, is, is fantastic for engagement. I, that is my standard go-to choice. But that relies on the people that have hired me being willing for me to do that. Some of them, some of them are a bit scared. The technology will their platform permit me to use it. So I find often I'm constrained by that. So one of the things I'm trying to suss out here is what are the parameters of my engagement? So who's the audience? What have they seen before? What are they going to be seeing afterwards? What have they been told? Uh, and, and what are their mental models in terms of my presentation? So if I've used a very provocative title, then I need to stick truer to that. If I've been given a very rigid, dull sounding title, that might be a clue that the audience is a particular type and I need to kind of carry the audience with me. So there's a lot of thought uh, that goes into these sort of structures. That is uh, fabulous. There are so many strands that you've just shared with us that I'd really like us to um, tease out and, and pause on. So, because I think there's some real gold in here, Christian. So firstly, when it comes to a title, what comes first? Is it the title or the presentation? Yeah, so it, it depends how much free reign I have. So sometimes they've decided what they'd like me to speak about. Very limited room to move, um, at which point the, the, the thing's almost a given. Other times it's, what would you like to talk about? And so I start with that. And, and I basically, I try to make it as interesting sounding as possible. My view is if you are going to put a badge up there and you know, it'll appear on a website or in a, in a you know, traditional sense, it's up in the, in the sort of the pamphlet that, or the leaflet that people get on the, the program, if you like. Um, so I try and make it sound interesting and engaging. So to the extent that I can influence it, I do. I, I think it's important and helpful to have that there. But one of the other things I realize in the creative process is that that title can, it can be great as an anchor in, in terms of giving you direction of travel. It can also be terrible because if you've come up with something before you've planned the detail, what you can end up with is something that actually doesn't really help you. So I don't feel too constricted by what the title is. It is, it's there. I've either had discussion and I, I tend to riff off that and move in whatever direction. And generally speaking, if your presentation is interesting, engaging and insightful, People aren't going to be too hung up and go, but you said you were going to be talking about these things. They've almost forgotten what it is. They've just remembered they've had a great presentation. So the experience of going through it is much more important. But I do think it sends a signal, and particularly where you're in an event where people have a choice whether or not to attend, and even if they're attending, whether or not to pay attention, something that is a bit more eye-catching is helpful. And so I try to the extent that I can pose a question that's going to get people thinking. Uh, position, ju juxtapose things that don't make sense together. And therefore, just people want to know what's going on, spark that sense of curiosity, and then you, you've got a slightly stronger opportunity to start. But if the title's dull, then recognize that and maybe riff off it. But maybe a dull title is what your audience is expecting, at which point, actually, it's not necessarily a handicap. So I just work with whatever I'm given. I think, um, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, it, it can also be different if you're in a concurrent session situation. Uh, certainly in, in live events when you're almost battling for eyeballs in the program, aren't you? So people have to make a selection versus being a keynote when, you know, they are there, you're in, they're more likely to be attentive because you're the only show on stage. So that also can figure into it. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and I find those ones that have different streams can be really interesting because very often you'll be up against the exact person you don't want to be up against and you sort of think wouldn't it be great if we could have if i could come before or after them so you have to sort of deal with that i mean luckily in most cases there's an on-demand element to these things so you there's a there's a catch-up audience and i think it's worth remembering as we go through presentations that if there is that catch-up on-demand element there's a second chance for people to catch it so don't sit there and let that stay you know uh, there's sort of thinking oh my god there's only five people and up against this is you're up against a, 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 almost an audience into perpetuity. So I, I, I kind of riff with that a little bit. Now, if it genuinely is a case, if it's me or them, that's a slightly different piece. So um, I, I try and work with organizers there and say, look, I don't think it's a good idea. You know, schedule clashing, putting, putting this up against that's not such a great idea, maybe shift it. But sometimes that's hard to do. Mm. And then I think, you know, you just have to do the best that you can. And I view all of these things as a continuing development process. So I'll do a presentation and I never think I've got this nail. I always spot things I could have done better. And in fact, every single presentation I do is slightly different. So even if I'm presenting the same thing, I will introduce a new slide. I will try a new line. And I look at it a little bit like, and I'm not comparing myself to them, you know, comedians that test out new jokes. You've got to try and test and see, see what works. So I'll be continually pushing the boundaries. 
So I will never do the same presentation twice. And that recognizes that we always have room for improvement. And I think that's part of the fun for me. It's what keeps me alive and on my toes is a little bit of competition is good. You know, I, of course, I want to be the most exciting presentation of the day, but it's great when you're in the midst of a load of other people that are great because that will help you raise your game. And I think um, we've, we've talked a lot about the title and, and we've touched on intro as well. You mentioned also end game and being clear on what the end game is. So talk us through your, your philosophy when it comes to coming to structure your presentation and the role, the end game, what do you want people to do at the end of your presentation plays? So, so first thing to, to, that I always think about is you, you need to end on a, on a high. And, and so, you know, we know this from behavioral science, the peak end rules so people remember how you finish. So having something that is a strong finish is helpful. I tend to finish with a Q&A because what I want to, I don't want people walking out of the room thinking, what, what is the, you know, I've got this burning question. So I, I try and have, allow enough time, particularly where I'm in a disruptive sort of presentation where I'm presenting a different way of doing things. I want to make sure that if somebody's cynical about it, I've offered them the opportunity to do it. And so I tend to try and close out with, with audience engagement. And I will make sure that I've got some things that I've held back from the presentation that I, the, you know, interesting facts, interesting anecdotes that I can bring into that space. So we continue the energy that we've had before. I try and save a real sort of, you know, sort of eye opener. So maybe it's an image or something for, for near the end. So again, that's fresh in people's minds. And of course, I'm bringing them a summary of the things I've talked about before. So closing out, reminding people of the things that you have told them is, is, is very, very powerful. But, you know, that's when the energy, in many respects, I look at it and say energy levels need to be high at the beginning. They need to be high at the end. You don't want to fizzle out like a damp squib and you need to kind of continue energy. And so the risk of closing out with Q&A is, of course, that there aren't any questions. So you have to prepare around that and be ready for that, that to happen. But I want people to go out with a sense that they have been listened to, with a sense that they've got some interesting stories and sticking those memorable things at the end helps to do that. That's an interesting perspective because I think um, the risk with Q&A, as, as you've mentioned, ending on Q&A is either there aren't any, in which case you have to have a contingency, or the, the questions are, are flat. There's a flatness to them. Um, you, you know, you have someone that may be asking questions with a particular agenda in mind or, or what have you, and it means that You've lost control to a degree of the narrative. So something that I've been experimenting with is to uh, have a QA and a just before the conclusion so that then we go back into me holding the reins of that presentation. So it sounds like you're doing that anyway, but perhaps less formally. Would that be right? Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. I mean, Q&A is audience participation time. And, and we know, you know, there's several. So if you put yourself in the perspective of the audience, it's like, oh, God, we've got to ask a question. And we all hate that thing where you go to a magic show or something. And it's like, we need a volunteer. And everybody's <laughs> kind of like, oh. so, so we have to think about that. So, so one of the things I try to do is to is pay close attention to questions I've been asked before. So if there are no questions, I can seed it with well, one of the questions I'm often asked is this start talking about something. So I'm ready for that. Maybe I've seeded some questions with the, 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 the questioner, uh, particularly in a virtual environment, of course, you can always have the dynamic of, we've had some questions through on the chat, which even if there aren't any, feels like a legitimate thing. So there's a bit of curation there. The, the, the other thing I do is try and riff a little bit off the question. So, so, so there's a tiny bit of, if you don't get a question you like, is answer the question you wish you'd been asked or take it a little bit further. Because I think particularly where people are exploring a subject that they're new to, Maybe they haven't had time to fully formulate the question. And so I buy a little bit of time for other people to think, but also just try and expand it out and think, let's take, take a broader piece. But you are spot on. There is often an agenda. It's, it's not a question. It's a criticism. It's not a question. It's I want to look really clever. Uh, and so one has to be ready. So you're right. It is a hugely risky strategy. And I do like that idea of, of grabbing, almost grabbing the mic at the end. So it closes out quite nicely in the engaging match. So you're right. I thrive a little bit on the let's see what might happen here dynamic. But I get your point entirely. If, if, if one is in a situation where you think there's a big risk associated with it, having an element of control, I think, helps you as a presenter, no question. And one of the, um, I'm just going to pull up another video whilst we're here. 
Something I loved, Christian, was you in a Q&A talking about in the gamification session that is on your website that people can, and I'll put in the show notes, but you take the question of gamification and you talk about the peak end rule, which you've touched on there. So let's have a look and a listen. And so the interesting thing about gamification is, yes, of course, we're going to remember the fun that we have. But it, if we associate learning with fun, we're going to remember the thing that we would do at the time. It's a more vivid memory than something that's dull and tedious. So yes, you will focus on the game, but the learning will be associated with a really positive experience. And if you think about experiences that you've had in your life where you've remembered really good memories, you've got a lot more detail about those in your head than you have some of the dull things like maybe commuting to work. You will remember your commutes or maybe even your video calls if they just feel the same. So that differentiator, yes, we focus on the fun that we're having, but we don't associate the memory with that fun. It's easier to recall because it stands out and it's more pleasurable. So far from detracting, it actually massively enhances the message. It works really well. Think about when you were at school. The teachers that made it fun are the ones you look back on fondly and remember. And the ones that made it boring are probably the ones you want to forget about. Same thing applies when we're adults. Fun equals memory. And given we're trying to train people to remember things, really powerful. And what I loved about that, Christian, is that it doesn't just apply to gamification, it applies to presentations. So my curiosity was really about how you make your presentations particularly fun and engaging when you do, when you are talking about compliance ethics regulation a lot of the time. So uh, th that's probably the worst clip to pick because that, that one was, I was asked not to use any imagery at all, which is why we had that, that plain background. But ordinarily what I, what I do is I try and get away from what I see happening quite a bit, which is if presentation equals PowerPoint slides. So I start from the basic premise, PowerPoint is the devil's work because actually it is encouraging people to, you know, it's got lots of features like bullet points and headers. And so it's encouraging people to put text on a piece of paper and then project that on the proverbial wall. And, and so I try and steer away from that. So, so my number one rule is if I can avoid using PowerPoint, I, I do. And in fact, I have refused to do certain speaking engagements because they insisted on a PowerPoint deck. Um, and it's one of the big shifts for me was moving from the corporate world where you're tightly constrained about the fonts you can use and you need to use certain template, very, very restrictive for understandable reasons. And I found myself in that context being almost very rebellious and I would push the limits of the template and occasionally whisper it, not use the template um, it, as far as I could. Now I have complete freedom and, 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 and I can do what I want. And I start with saying, well, what's the best way to get my message across? And it's not, let's put a load of things on a slide and just read them out. Um, you know, the exception being possibly things like my resume where I'm, I'm trying to engage an audience that would expect something in that form. And so I'm a big fan of images. I'm a big fan of cartoons. I'm a big fan of you know, emojis, icons, any, things that are visual to help support the point that I'm making. And it may not necessarily be a literal thing. I might have something just to engage people. So I'm, I'm on the lookout for advertisements that are interesting, building signs, things in the real world that we recognize. And particularly when I'm talking about a subject that might seem quite dry. You know, if I'm talking about compliance, talking about rules and regulations in a work context is quite boring. Talking about COVID and how the supermarkets are trying to manipulate, much, much, much more interesting. So I find examples from the real world. So there's one, one slide I love using, which is a path near where I live in London, which is where they've attempted to stop people taking bicycles down the path. And they've designed this, this, this fence to stop it from happening. And actually, everybody's just gone round it. And I show this picture and I said, this is a good example of the compliance program. And it's a picture. And if you ask me to summarize what compliance programs sometimes look like, I would show you this picture. And, and that's slightly, it's partly playing surprise there because people don't expect to see that when you talk about compliance. But what I'm trying to do is take things from the real world and get win the audience over by finding things that everybody will recognize. And pictures, as they say, speak a thousand words. So, you know, I, I, I use things like advertisements from Lego in my presentation. Nothing to do with the subject, but makes a really strong point. Things, and so I spend my whole life, I, I, you know, I, I always get sort of challenged by people because I'm taking pictures of weird things as I walk around. I'm always looking for real life examples of interesting things that I can use to make a point. Visually arresting is probably the way that I try and describe it. Yes, I was struck by your use of metaphor analogy, uh, very much a, a lot of attempt to bridge that divide between the compliance hat that people have to wear and their hat as a human being, because ultimately you're talking about humans posing the risk 
to organisations. And so um, I loved how you sort of wove that fabric in order to take people on a journey because I think there are so many um, conceptions around what compliance means. And as, as I think you even mentioned, everyone just thinks it's rules, regulations, terms and conditions, when in fact it's a, a people issue. But you know, what, what, what is interesting is, so the, the first thing is, if I'm coming into an audience and I'm going to be implicitly saying the way you're doing this is wrong, or there's a different way to do it. If, you, if you're attacking the thing that they've helped design, that, then you're on the back foot. And the point that I want to make to people is that those human beings that, that live their lives, that go around and uh, go shopping and walk around the streets and have families and are, you know, have a sort of normal life, they're the same human beings when they're in a corporate environment. And so often the processes that we impose on people in corporate environment, you wouldn't do it in another context. And so I, I take a little bit of inspiration here from comedy. Well, if you look, a lot of comedy is around taking something from one context and plonking it into another. And we suddenly laugh about it because it looks weird. So what I'm trying to do is to take this idea of compliance, which feels like a work thing, and saying it's happening to you all the time. And let's have a look at how people do it in the real world. So if I'm talking about process inside a company, it's much more effective to talk about that thing that happens when we all download an app and we have to accept terms and conditions or renting a car or going shopping, something we all do much more. We've done, you know, well, firstly, we've done that more often. So we've done those leisure activity things more often than we have the corporate ones. And it's more engaging. It's less controversial. And it's just, it's again, it's not what people expect. They expect to be told about some boring rule or regulation. And so talking about the pro last time I rented a car, you know, is a to it's, it's a story about me. It's much more interesting. So I try and try and bridge, bridge that particular gap. And, and, you know, this is stealing shamelessly from, let's go back to the Bible. You know, we parables are there in the Bible. Stories work. And I think you're, you're so right. And I think um, the, the more metaphor and analogy that we can use, um, it, it gets through those defences, as you were saying. And I have to do a similar thing because when, and many presenters do, because we are trying to create a tension about what is the status quo? So what people are used to and the new world that we're painting a picture of, which we want them to adopt. So it's that tension and making sure we're taking people on that journey rather than creating reactants and closing them down. And you mentioned also um, a bit earlier the difference between virtual and stage presentation. So how have you adapted, particularly now that a lot of presentations are virtual? Same way that one needs to be confident when you're standing on stage, you need to understand how to engage the audience, you want to be moving around a little bit, lots of gestures. How do we do that in the virtual environment? And so that involves understanding the technology. So uh, I went through a series of upgrades of webcams using lighting, a whole load of things like that. You know, microphones matter hugely in this environment and then starting to move into things like software. So I've really been learning what works and I see myself very much in the, in the sort of foothills of what's possible is learning about how this medium works. What, what am I good at? What, what plays well to my strengths? What doesn't play well to my strengths? Thinking about the fact that you can't read the audience correct properly. Uh, and, and, and so there's a whole load of things that one needs to get used to doing that are very unnatural and very, very different. And so it's been a, you know, I, I just jumped in and thought, well, I've got to do this. This is my life now. This is my business. And I'll embrace it. And far from seeing it as a constraint, I'm always looking for ways to make it better. How can we find better ways to engage? Because if we're stuck in this particular format, then we need to make the most of the format. And that's where things like the software mm -hmm, that I talked about before, which, which allows you to basically sit inside the slide, sit inside the imagery. So you, you, there isn't this dichotomy between present presenter and imagery and slides that they're using. Do clever, engaging things with that. You can control it with a PlayStation controller. I love that because, firstly, it's a great opener for a presentation. So if I can say I'm controlling this with this, that feels counterintuitive. It's also quite fun. If I get to steer my presentation using a PlayStation controller, gets the most out of me because I feel like I'm playing a game. So I've been on this, this evolving stuff and I'm constantly looking for new, new things that work for me. And small tweaks, I find, can make a massive difference um, in terms of in, you know, testing things out. And that's why I see this very much an experimental genre. We have an opportunity to try things out and test it. You, know, you don't want the whole thing to be experimental, but incremental experimentation, trying new things, absolutely key part of it. Yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful sentiment and one that you echoed in taking sort of a, a com uh, comedian's um, 
patter if they insert a few new jokes in a set that they know is pretty rock solid we can do that with our presentations and certainly we can do it when we're trying to embrace new technologies and new ways of engaging an audience christian this has been fabulous i've really loved um, particularly comments around how to conceptualize your audience and think of particularly what title and how, how you want your title to fit and also very important points around context, context around what time am I going to be on stage, virtual or, or in real life? So where am I on the program? What sort of state of energy are my audience going to be in and where do we need them to be? Because that will change how you structure things. We've talked about the use of story. We've talked about how your introdu introductions change according to um, the context that you're presenting in. And we've just touched on technology as well. Do you have any other final tip that you'd like to share with viewers of Talking Talks? Yeah, I, I enjoy it, right? Because this could be the most stressful thing you ever have to do, particularly in a virtual environment, right? So in front of an audience is scary because there's people looking at you. In a virtual environment, it's terrifying because it's you on your own, looking into a camera lens, doing something that's very, very unnatural. And I find that just relaxing and enjoying it and recognize you're going to screw stuff up. And I think one of the joys of this is I love going, I got away with that, right? That's to, Or I've just found myself saying something in a way that I would never have said before. And so I think having this spirit of fun and engagement, and we often conflate, and this is where my compliance piece are, we often conflate, oh, this is a really serious topic. I need to present it in a serious manner. I need to be incredibly slick. And of course, that is very impressive if you can be slick. But most of us are human. Most of us will screw up. And I think playing with that and recognizing it uh, can produce some amazing results. So I like to channel my inner child, have some fun when I'm doing it, show the camera some love, and just see, see what happens and treat it like an exciting adventure. And generally speaking, that seems to work because people keep hurrying me back. So that's my formula. Here and your energy comes through the screen. I'm in Melbourne, you're in the UK, and I, I feel like we're in the room together. So, Christian, thank you so much. That's all we have time for on this episode of Talking Talks. For more information about Christian, you can find him at human risk.com and you can look at those presentations that we've referenced, as well as all of the podcasting and consulting and training work that he does so check out human-risk.com you can always find me at brewilliams.com but uh so that you don't miss out on any future episodes make sure you subscribe and i look forward to talking talks with you again soon at the u at the uk at the uk prudent i'll stop recording